Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming back from the break. Um, I'm Doug Sillers. I'm originally from Seattle, Washington, but I'm traveling with my family as a digital nomad around Europe. And today I'm happy to talk with you all about delivering fast and beautiful images and video. A little bit about me. I do freelance developer relations. I also do a lot with web and native app performance, helping people build applications that run faster. Um, uh, I specialize in performance images and video. I wrote a book on high-performance Android apps. If you're interested, that's the URL for the PDF, so you can um, download that. I'll post the slides at the end of the talk so you can get all the URLs later on. If you ever want to get in touch, I'm the only Doug Sillers on the internet, so I'm pretty easy to find. One cool thing about talking about delivering beautiful images is I get to show off lots of cool pictures. Uh, this is called First Cliff Walk. It's in Switzerland. And how many of you kind of get freaked out thinking about walking across this walkway that's nailed into the side of a mountain? Anyone? Okay, I see a few hands. That's awesome. Me, me too. Uh, my six-year-old daughter thought it'd be a blast to jump the whole way across this, so it rattled. It really freaked out her brothers and sisters, uh, probably on purpose. Um, but about two years ago, Erickson did a study and they put sensors on people's heads to measure stress responses to different activities. And they found that queuing in line raised people's stress. They found that thinking about standing on the edge of a cliff really freaked people out. But interestingly, they found that slow mobile experiences are actually more stressful than standing on the edge of a cliff. And so if as us as developers, when we build slow experiences, our customers are feeling exactly like we were feeling about 90 seconds ago. And if you're feeling anxious or you're feeling stressed out, you're less likely to reuse that application, buy anything from that application, right? You want people to have happy experiences when they're visiting your content, so they spend more money. A lot of research has been done on this. Google found that 53% of users abandoned a mobile site after three seconds of delay. Another study found that half a second increased frustration and lowered engagement. A classic, two classic studies from 17 years ago, both Amazon and Walmart independently found that one, uh, 100 milliseconds of delay caused a 1% drop in revenue. And for companies like that, that's, well, for any company, 1% revenue is a huge amount of money. Um, obviously, for Amazon and Walmart, it's a number with a lot of zeros afterwards. Um, but also, 4% of mobile users admit to throwing their phones when there's a slow mobile experience. So when you see someone on the train or on the tram with a broken phone, hopefully it's not because of your site or your app. So we know that making apps and websites run quickly is important. Our customers expect things to be delivered quickly. And if we look at the average website, the average website is about 50% images and 25% video. This is from the HTTP archive. And you may be thinking, most websites don't have video, and you're absolutely right. The sites that do have video throw off the average so much to make every single website have an average of 25% kilobytes as video. Just like if Jeff Bezos came and sat in the front of the room right here, our average salary would be $100 million each. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way for everybody. So what we see here is that images and video make up a huge chunk of the content that's delivered over the network. And so if we can deliver that content quickly, that means our pages will load faster. So what can we do? This is a picture that I took a couple weeks ago in Porto, uh, in Portugal. And on my phone, it was 7.9 megabytes. And so there's a lot of color. There's a lot of activity here. About two weeks later, I was in Oslo. And I'm from Seattle, so this is not a dig on Oslo at all. But this image is only 3.5 megabytes because there are a lot fewer colors, right? So. Now, granted, if you're ever going to have a, um, you know, try to, uh, you know, talk about visiting a city like in a tourism guide, you'd want a picture like this and not a picture like that. So in general, we're going to have these really big images with a lot of color, a lot of color diversity. So what can we do to optimize those images? We're not going to have grayscale images. Does, everybody, does anyone here know about Lighthouse? I see a couple hands. Oh, that's pretty good, about 30% of the audience. So Lighthouse is in Chrome DevTools. Um, and what it does is it looks to see different optimizations you can do to make your web page run faster. There are tools that will do this for native apps as well, and I, I'll talk about that a little bit. But inside Lighthouse, there are four image optimizations, quality, format, sizing, and lazy loading. 
And if you run your web page through Lighthouse, you'll get a score from 0 to 100. Obviously, 0 is bad, 100 is good. So let's walk through these optimizations and see what's going on. Now, Lighthouse is run every single time. You can run it in Chrome DevTools. It's also part of web page test. And if you're ever auditing a web page, this is a great way to look for performance issues on, on your web page using web page test. Web page test has instances all around the world, so you can test to see how your web page loses in America, in Europe, in Asia, all around the world. And then the HTTP archive is built on top of web page test. So every time the HTTP archive data comes out, you get Lighthouse results for all of the web pages. And this data is based on 500,000 websites that were run. And it's a Lighthouse data from 500,000 websites. So what happens on, on 500,000 websites with quality of images? The Lighthouse report recommends that all images are saved at 85% quality. Now, the lower the quality, the more pixelated it becomes. This is a lossy compression technique. You're going to lose pixels, and the image isn't going to look as nice. However, Google has found that 85% is generally good enough for all images. No one will notice the difference. There are a lot of ways you can do 85%. You can use image magic, uh, set the quality to 85, and it'll save a new image for you. Uh, they're cloud-based tools like Cloudinary. You upload the full-size image, and then you'll see in yellow it says Q85. On the fly, it'll generate a quality 85% image for you. So what does that look like? Here's a picture of Riga Latvia taken with my phone, 3.6 megabytes. When I save it at 85% quality, it's half the size, 1.87 megabytes. So we've already made this, I mean, it's still too big, right? It's still too large, but it's going to get delivered twice as quickly because the image is that much smaller. If we look at the top half million websites from the HTTP archive, we find that 43% of websites get 100% on saving images at 85% quality. Unfortunately, about a third of the internet is, gets a zero, meaning that none of the images are at 85% quality or lower. Lighthouse further goes in and will tell you how much faster the web page will be if you implement this. And they found that on 3G, I took all of the ones that failed, and the median at the 50th percentile on 3G would be 2.8 seconds faster and would use 420 kilobytes less data. Right? That's a pretty huge improvement for a 3G. And obviously, if you're on 2G, it would be even a bigger improvement in page load time. But what if we could do better? I mean, 85% is kind of Google's like, it works for most everybody. Well, here's 50%. It's, again, half the size. But if you start looking, it's not a perfect image. It's a little hard to see. But at 20%, you can definitely tell that this image is you know, not the quality that you'd want to put up on your web page. You can see the, the lines up in the sky. So if we look at that, we know 85% generally good enough, 20% really bad. But where's that sweet spot in the middle? And wouldn't it be great if we could do this automatically rather than just kind of guess some, guess some percentages and see where that is? In fact, we can. Google has a tool called Booter Ugly. And uh, if you ever look at Google's compression tools, they're all named after Swiss pastries. So it's kind of fun, especially when you go to Switzerland and you walk down the bakery aisle and you see all your compression in different parts of the bakery aisle. OK, yeah, I, I've done that. Um, the other thing you can do is structural similarity. And these are algorithms that go to the quality, lower the quality to the area where the human eye can't tell the difference. So that's better than 85%, right? That gets you to right where the, we as humans can't tell the difference. Um, there's some tools there. There's uh, CJPEG DSSIM. It's an open source tool. Tools like Cloudinary, you just set Q auto. It'll generate for it on the fly. And if you remember, 85% was 1.87 megabytes. This is 1.46. We cut off another 400 kilobytes, and nobody knows the difference. This image is just as beautiful as the full-size one, and, and, but it's going to get delivered over twice as quickly. And we can see that. So I run these, just these images through web page test on a 3G connection with a real Motorola G4 device in Virginia. And you can see the full speed. The full-size image is 3.7 megabytes. It takes 21.7 seconds. With structural similarity, we're under 10 seconds. So we've already doubled the delivery speed of this image, which is great, but we can still do better. Let's look at image format. There are a bunch of different image formats out there. If we look at sort of the average size of all those different formats, you see JPEG in general are larger than the others, but I think that just may be sampling. <clears throat> Let's talk about SVGs to begin with. So SVGs are vector graphics. I think there's a talk right after this one about SVGs. 
I'd recommend. <coughs> <coughs> you should go check it out. Um, <coughs> there are images drawn as shapes. Uh, they're infinitely scalable, and because they're vectors, <coughs> I'm sorry, they're infinitely scalable, and they're XML. So you can just inline them straight into your HTML document. So this Twitter icon is the same icon, and you can stretch it, and there's no, you know, there's no pixelation. It doesn't look bad. I found this logo on a web page on a website in Brazil. It's for a popular social media app, and it's a SVG. I open up the XML, and if you look down at the bottom, I've enlarged it a little bit, but you can see there's this Adobe Illustrator thing. And if you look in the upper right, you can see how far I can scroll on this page in the XML document. And they generated this SVG with Illustrator, and they exported it. And when they exported it, it ended up being 1.3 megabytes in size. And so I fixed it by opening it up in my favorite text editor and deleting all of that stuff. And I made it 99.99 something percent smaller, 900 bytes. Of course, because it's XML, we can gzip it or we can use Broadly, um, another Google algorithm, right? Bread. Um, and we get down to about half a kilobyte. So I guess the moral of this story is SVGs are great for things that can become vector graphics, but test it before you push it into production. Um, this website actually had five SVGs over a megabyte each. It should have been about two and a half K and ended up being five megabytes on their web page, which is a bit ridiculous. Um, we can also look at WebP images. So WebP is a JPEG just celebrated its 26th birthday, like last week or last month. WebP is about seven or eight years old. It's based on the VP8 um, video encoder. And you can see that the average WebP is half the size of JPEG. So that'd be really awesome, right? What if we could save our images as WebP and they'd be way smaller? Until recently, WebP was just a Google thing. It was just Chrome, it was just Android. If you look over in the corner here though, we got Edge. And Edge was just added the beginning of October, right? This is brand new. However, this is my tweet from like two days ago. Now it's in Firefox, like this is changing really, really quickly. And now WebP, I took this screenshot like 25 minutes ago. Um, we've got it in almost all of the major browsers. We're still waiting for, for a couple, but it's under development for those, those other browsers. So really soon WebP will be supported in most major modern browsers, which is really exciting. What happens when I take my image and I save it as a WebP? Well, we just shaved off another four or 500 kilobytes of data. We're under a megabyte. And when I load that on uh, the in web page test, we're down to seven seconds load time, about a megabyte in size. Now, of course, not all browsers will support WebP, so you can list the WebP first and then have a fallback to the JPEG, and this will work just great. And you should always have an alt tag for people who can't see the images. If we look at image format use in the wild, 67% of the web gets a zero in Lighthouse it, based on the HTTP archive. So there's a lot of room for improvement here. The median web page that um, scored a zero could be 4.1 seconds faster on 3G and use 600 kilobytes less data. Again, we're talking about a huge speed up and a huge reduction in the amount of data uh, for your web pages. We can also talk about sizing the images. So, you know, here's a picture that I took of a cathedral in Novi Sad, Serbia. And it's a 13 megapixel image. It was 1.6 megabytes. As soon as I do all the optimizations we just talked about, I have the size to 800K, but it's still 13 megapixels. And the problem with this is, of course, is when I download it to a mobile phone that, you know, is a lot smaller, I end up throwing away 12.5 million of those pixels. So on a low powered device, you get doubly taxed. You have to download this giant file, then the CPU has to fire up and throw away like 95% of the data before it shows up on the screen. And on a slower device, that's gonna take a lot of time. The best analogy I can come up to this in the real world is like when you buy something from Amazon and you get a box and then you have to go through like eight meters of brown paper to find that your kid ordered a pencil, right? We've all had that happen, at least once. Um, so we should really resize the images to fit the size of the screen that we're dealing with. 
that's a little tricky when you start looking at all the Android devices that hit Akamai in one day. There are about 6,600 devices here. The size of the box is how many of each device hit. The color of the uh, of the box is how fast the CPU is. So you can see there are you know there are a bunch of really fast devices that have a hard, large number of users, but there are a lot of devices that don't have a lot of market share that are really really slow. So we need to figure out the right size for all of these different devices. And the answer is, of course, responsive images. And this has been around for a while. But one idea behind responsive images is generate a different set of images where they're all 25 kilobytes different in size. And that way, when I do this, I generate a whole bunch of different size images. The browser picks the right size image for this device. And now I'm only wasting 100,000 pixels as opposed to 12.5 million. That's a huge improvement. The tool I used was a responsive breakpoint generator. You can download it from GitHub, or you can use the web interface. You tell it the, the dimensions here. I said between 200 and 1,400 pixels, 25 kilobytes different. Give me 20 images. And it gives me a list of images. And you can build some HTML that looks like this. But let's just do a demo, because that's more fun than looking at code. So this is the, the website. And as I resize it, different size images are going to download. And so you know when it's a different size image, every other image is sepia to color. So as I make this smaller, right, there's a new image. And it doesn't take a lot here when they have big images right, to shave off 25K. But you can see you know, this image is like 25 kilobytes. This one is like 200 kilobytes. Right? You're going to serve the exactly the right size image for the device with just the right amount of data, ensuring that Every customer gets a beautiful experience with your image, but doesn't use a crazy amount of data and doesn't download too much, wasting data, wasting time. You'll see the huge jump in performance improvement here, because now for that Motorola G4, I'm not serving 13 megapixels. I'm serving the right size image. It's now five seconds faster, from seven seconds to two seconds. And it went from one megabyte to 121 kilobytes. Huge. That's a great improvement. A lot of people are doing this right. 57% pass the Lighthouse score, but still 22%, a fifth of the internet, are failing this. If we look at those sites that are failing it, uh, the, uh, the median site would, on a 3G connection would be 2.7 seconds faster and use about 400 kilobytes less data. Again, all of these improvements are pretty huge and would really benefit your website. And of course, these all translate to mobile apps as well. The last optimization I'd like to talk about is lazy loading. And this one now is, of course, beyond just one image. It's what you do on your web page or in your app. And so here's an app or a web page. It has seven images on it. And traditionally, you have to wait for the page to all load all seven images before the, the page is done loading. But what if we just don't load the images that your customers can't see? And now we're only loading two images at load time. It's going to load up a lot faster. If we look at lazy loading in the HTTP archive, not a lot of people are doing it. 60% are failing completely. Of those sites that fail, they would be three and a half seconds faster. The median site, again, would be three and a half seconds faster on 3G and use 500 kilobytes less data. And so what a lot of sites are now doing is they're using preview images. So here, this is on my, uh, in Google Photos, you search for cats in costume, and you sort of get a color uh, impression of what's going to load. You get green for the cat dressed up as an alligator, pink for the cat dressed up as a bunny. You know an image is coming as a customer, and once the image loads, it pops into the back. It, it replaces that background image, and it looks great. If you want to go a little fancier with preview images, this is a tool called Squib, and it creates an SVG impression. Instead of just being green, you can sort of see like white sort of where the waterfall is. So this is 900 bytes. You can put it on your web page. You know, zip it and uh, gzip it, and it'll be really, really small. And then when the 120K full size image comes down, it will just replace it. So you can use lazy loading. There are a lot of JavaScript libraries that will do lazy loading for you. There's some links at the end of my talk that you can look at um, so that you can just have this run and the images below the fold don't load until you, the customer scrolls up nearby and then they'll load in the background. So as an experiment, um, you may have seen this Chrome, De Chrome, Chrome Dev Summit was this week, and there's a lot of talk about lazy loading. And there's an experimental flag in Chrome today for lazy loading. And so this is a web page that I've shrunk down so you can see the entire page 
and each viewport is marked by a red line. And so the first screen is up there at the top. There are, there are four images, one wide across the top and then three across the, the middle there. And when you load that page today in Chrome, you see first the text comes in and then a few of the images load. And then, you know, you can see the, the text is reflowing every single time I took one of these screenshots, right? You can see the text slowly sliding down the screen. You can see like the image of the cow has loaded before some of the images above the fold, the things that our customers see initially in number four. Um, and then finally, by number five, there are a whole bunch of images. But if you look, the last one on the right on the, above the fold is still a placeholder. It hasn't actually loaded all the way. So we have this thing where the, the website is loading all these images below the fold that our customers can't see, and they're waiting for the stuff above the fold to load. So inside Chrome, they have a lazy loading experiment. And so they're going to actually enable lazy loading in the browser. And so what happens here is it does a two requests for each image. It initially does a two kilobyte requ uh, 206 request. It asks for the first two kilobytes of every image. With those two kilobytes, it gets the size in width and the height, and it also gets the number of kilobytes each image is. And so you can see by three, the entire page is laid out. It knows where every image is going to go on the page. So if your customers are scrolling up and down, you don't get reflows. The text doesn't move. The entire page is laid out. Then as you watch from three to four to five to six, the images are loading top to bottom, which is what you would expect to have happen, what makes the most sense for our customers, right? You want the images that they're going to see first to load first. And so this is, going to, this is coming soon. It's currently behind a flag. But this is going to come soon to um, Chrome, where the images are just going to load in order, and it's going to look a lot better for our customers. So that's pretty exciting stuff. <clears throat> the next thing I'd like to talk about with images are animated GIFs, because everybody loves animated GIFs. And this is my goat, Nora, because we need more goat GIFs on the internet. Um, this video I took with my phone, again, 1.4 megabytes, and I GIFed it, right? Because this is what the internet needs. <clears throat> However, when you make an animated GIF, it's a lot larger. It's now 3.8 megabytes. And I sort of joked that, um, that JPEGs are 26 years old. Well, GIFs are from the 1980s, so they only have 256 colors. And in the spec for the GIF, they say, we have an animated format, but we don't recommend that anybody uses it. And this is one of the reasons why. And the reason why this file is so much larger is that GIFs, so when you have a video, you can compress you know, the, the x, y dimensions, but you can also compress through time, that third dimension. GIFs don't do that compression through time. So if you have 15 frames per second, it's literally flipping through 15 GIFs every single second. And you can actually break out each one of those images and see them by, you could just tear apart the animated GIF and see those. So what can we do to make this, this GIF smaller? This is what a lot of companies do. So you'll actually go to Twitter and they'll say GIF. It's not actually a GIF. They're lying to us. And the reason for that is I can make this an MP4, cut out the number of colors to 256 to make it GIFy, and now it's only 250 kilobytes. That's 93% smaller than the animated GIF was. Another trick you can do is if you're just going straight to the MP4, is you can strip out the audio channel of your video because GIFs are silent, and that will make the, the movie even smaller. <clears throat> then what you can do is pop it into a video tag. And so for this to work on mobile, you have to say loop, obviously, because it's the GIF, right? You set it to autoplay and muted. It has to be muted to autoplay on mobile. And this is so that when you're um, in a meeting and you're surfing the internet, that those videos don't make noise and you get busted that you're surfing the internet when you're supposed to be paying attention. Um, and then plays in line is for iOS. But this will loop a video. Now, browsers are really smart, and they will always load video last because video files are really, really big. So this may actually delay, to some degree, the loading of your GIF, even though it's a lot smaller. A trick for Safari to, that runs today is you can actually put MP4 videos in the picture tag. So if you did this in Safari, it will load the MP4 video and loop it. You, know, you have to put all the loop parameters and everything in there. Um, but it'll play the GOAT MP4, 250 kilobytes. Uh, the animated WebP will come in for everybody on Chrome, right? That's about three megabytes. And then everybody else gets the animated GIF at 3.8 megabytes. So in this case, this is an awesome performance improvement for your Safari users because this is going to load really, really fast, and you get animated GIFs 
as a movie. We can look at the load times, and on a 3G connection, that for the animated GIF takes 22 seconds, the animated WebP takes about 18 and a half seconds, and the video at you know 250 kilobytes only takes four and a half seconds to download. Huge performance improvement. You can use it in the video tag for everybody, or if you use the picture tag, this will really help your, uh, your customers who are on Safari. And so you can see how I'm going here. I've gone to images, I've gone to a little bit of animated images, and now I'm gonna get into video, which is a quarter of the internet, or so they say. And what goes for everything else with performance goes with videos. And when a video takes a long time to start up, your customers get frustrated. And we all know that when customers get frustrated, they throw their phones. So we don't want that to happen. So what are the most important metrics when we look at video? What are we most concerned about? And these are the metrics that people actually follow. The first one of uh, the video quality metrics is, did the video start? It's kind of important. Did it stall? We all know that when a video stalls, people get frustrated and they move on. And then did it look good? So we're gonna look at these three metrics against uh, videos and see what happened and what we can do to improve the video delivery. Conviva is a really popular um, video analytics software and they released some results from Q1 of this year. And they found that of all of the video plays that they studied, 14% of them never actually played. Could you imagine if we were building a website or we were building an app and it didn't work 14% of the time? We probably wouldn't be at our job for much longer. So what can we do? You know, what's going on here? Why are these videos not playing? And what can we do to make sure that these videos do play in the future? If we actually look at the data, there was um, 17 billion plays that they studied in Q1 of this year. 400 million failed to start and 2 billion were abandoned before the, the video actually started. And they estimate that's about 800 million hours of video playback that were lost. That's a crazy amount of video that wasn't working. So what's going on? Um, let's look at the ones that failed to start. So I went through the HTTP archive and I looked for like 404s or 500 errors and there were a few, but it was like 0.2%. And this is like two and a half percent. So that wasn't everything. There's something else going on. I think a lot of it is stuff like this, right? You're like, I wanna watch this video. And it's like, sorry, you can't watch it in your country. Um, you know, being in, from America, I have an Amazon account. And when I'm open up the Amazon video app, here, it will say, ah, you're in Belgium. These are the videos you can't watch because we don't have the rights to show them in this country. You can watch them when you get back to America. Here are the ones you can watch. What that does is it prevents me from clicking a link and getting this really horrible response. Even further, it didn't take, doesn't take 231 requests and 3.1 megabytes to tell me, oops, right? If we can avoid doing that to our customers, that's gonna be a huge, I mean, the oops is kind of disappointing, but when you know you wasted all that data, it took that much time, that's even more infuriating. But let's also look at those ones where if somebody actually pressed play, they waited. And then they're like, this is never gonna work. What the heck? Um, some research from Akamai found that everyone will wait for two seconds. You press play, everyone will wait for two seconds, but then you lose about 6% of your audience every additional second. Now, it depends what type of video you're watching. For longer videos, people tend to hang out longer. But for short play videos, like you click on a link to watch the picture, a video of a cat dressed up like a shark, sitting on a Roomba, chasing a duck, and after about three seconds, you're like, what? And you start questioning your life values more than like what's actually on the video. So people abandon short play videos a lot more quickly than long play videos. And that sort of makes sense, right? If you're gonna sit down and watch an hour long TV show and it takes 10 seconds or 12 seconds, you've already sort of dedicated the next hour to watch that TV show. You'll hang out a little bit longer. So what can we do to get that video there a lot faster? This is a screenshot from a tool that I helped build when I was at AT&T, and we're looking at packets coming in and out of a device. The red line is the throughput, so there at 75 seconds, that was the ad being downloaded. And then you can see there's not a lot of packet cap packets going back and forth until the, the green line. So that's the ad playing back, right? So we had to download an ad, we had to watch it. Um, but then 
you know, there's nothing happening on the network. When the ad stops playing, the player's like, oh, yeah, they wanted to watch a movie. And it starts downloading the movie at like 107 seconds right here. So as a user, you had to sit, watch the ad, and then you have to look at a spinner for another five to 10 seconds. On average, you know, depending on the speed of the network, about five to 10 seconds, you have to wait for another spinner before the video starts up. Now we know the network's not doing anything for 30 seconds while the ad is playing back. So why don't they start downloading the movie when you're watching the ad, right? Then when the ad's done, you go straight into the movie. So you should always, if it makes sense to preload the video, you should always do that because that means that the video is going to be there and no one's waiting and it'll start up really, really quickly. However, you have to be careful with preload. On a web page, you can set preload equals auto. So video tag preload equals auto. This is a waterfall from web page tests and that's showing all the CSS, all the JavaScript, all the images, all the things downloading. But in there, they had a, a video. And remember, video is always loaded last in the browser. So you get looking something like this. So if you've ever been on a mobile site and you see a video on the page and you're like, I'm not gonna press play because I'm on my phone. I don't wanna waste all the data. In this case, the browser or the, the website decided for you, it's gonna download the whole video whether or not you press play. Now the problem with that, of course, is that it ends up being 23 megabytes of video that's downloaded every single time somebody visits this web page. Now, from an end user perspective, that kind of stinks, right? You're going into my data plan, it's wasting data. But you also have to think about the server costs and the transmission costs. Every single time somebody loads this web page, 23 plus megabytes of data are being transferred out of your data center to these end users or out of your CDN. And you're paying for that every single time that happens. So in general, you should use the preload equals auto if you know like 95% sure that they're gonna watch the video. Otherwise, you should probably not do that. Default is preload equals metadata, which is like the first couple percent of the video. Or you could say preload equals none. Um, you can get busted on preload equals metadata because I've found web pages that have a 200 megabyte video on there. And if it's the first two or 3%, that still ends up being five, four or five megabytes of data. So audit, see what happens. Your mileage may vary, but look to see what's happening. Like obviously 23 megabytes of video on every page load, maybe too much. Another thing that's become really, really popular on the web today are background videos. And so I think this will play. Yeah, there we go. Awesome. So the page loads and you get this video in the background. You're like, oh yeah, I really want to take my kids here. This looks like a lot of fun. Um, and so this is what it looks like. Um, and you know, they're marketing companies and granted they're marketing companies trying to sell you to do this. They say it improves engagement by like 80%. So you've probably heard people saying, you know, once the GDPR thing goes away, right, I have to click that. All right, now you can see the whole video. So you're gonna hear from your marketing team, this is really gonna improve our engagement. We should really, really do this. There's some things we can do to optimize the delivery of this video. The video that was downloaded on that web page is 5.3 megabytes. That's not so bad, that's not, that's not horrible. It's big, but it's a video, right? It's gonna be big. However, that video had an audio track to it. And so 250 kilobytes were downloaded that are never played because it's a silent movie. So, you know, if you're gonna to save bandwidth to make those things download or you can strip out the audio stream from the videos if they're being played silently. That goes for your animated GIFs that we talked about earlier. For background videos, it will make the videos smaller. Um, the other thing that to look at is, this is on mobile, and video is shown up as green. So it's down there at the bottom, right above the yellow line. There's two requests for the video. The video is being downloaded on the mobile version of this, of this website as well. However, if you look at the CSS, if the screen is below 600 pixels wide, the video does not display. And so actually on the device I was testing on, you get a placeholder image, even though the entire video is downloaded. So if the viewport isn't gonna support the video, you should probably not download it just to save data. Here's another example of a website that has a background video, but you'll never, ever, ever see it unless you're super duper patient. And we're gonna walk through the reasons why this video never plays back on your desktop. The first thing we learn about this video is that Bob Ross is not just a painter, he's also a photographer. But when we start looking at this video, it's 33.6 megabytes in size. It's 27 seconds long. It's 2560 by 1226, that's bigger than most desktop screens, right? 
and it's 10 megabits per second. So this is a huge, huge, huge video. So you should really resize your videos to a reasonable size for the devices that you're serving it to. Um, one pro tip is if you rename the file to 720p, that doesn't actually re-encode the video to 720p. As much as we wish that we're that easy, it doesn't actually work. So if you resize the video, and in this case I used, I, I mentioned Cloudinary earlier, you can do the same thing with video, you just set the width to 720, and I got a 1.76 megabyte video. 1080p is 8.1 megabytes, that's big. Maybe the 720p is more reasonable at 4.3 megabytes, but you can make this video a lot smaller so that people will actually see it. You know, if no one actually ever sees the video, it's not worthwhile even putting it up on the web page. So there are a lot of ways that you can optimize the video so that it shows up on the screen. Another thing we could just look at is when you take video from third parties, I get asked, well, what if I just put it up on YouTube or I put it up on Vimeo? YouTube and Vimeo don't download any video initially, but you're gonna get about 700 kilobytes of JavaScript, right? That's gonna get downloaded to download the player so that when you press play, that video starts playing right away. So that's an option, but you know, you're gonna, if you're not downloading the video, you get costs from another way and you should audit that to see if that makes sense. Another way you can share, how many people love TED Talks? Right, I see a bunch of hands, right? They're awesome. And there's a share button right there. And when you hit the share button, you get this div, you know, one line of code. Yes. What happens when you add that one line of code to your website? Well, when you do that, it downloads the entire video in the background, whether or not you press play. On the desktop, this turned out to be 118 requests and 32 megabytes. Now it's a stream, so it's gonna change. It'll be less on, on mobile than it would be on desktop. But what if you put two TED Talks on one, pit, one page, right? This, this just balloons. The entire video is downloaded, whether or not you are ready to watch it or not. So let's talk a little bit about video streaming and some best practices when it comes to video streaming. When you have video streaming, the, the, so what video streaming is, you have different bit rates of video available. And then the player on the phone decides which is the best bit rate for the size of the screen and the available network. And for the player to know what's available, you have to send a manifest file. And that manifest file gives you a list of available streams, what, what, you know, what the player can choose from. It's like the menu. The player chooses one of those streams. It starts getting a list of all of the different segments. And then it starts downloading those segments into the buffer. And what, ideally, what you have is you start seeing you know, the buffer is the line in front. So you want to make sure that you have enough video there so the video can play back and the video plays. Then once the video starts playing, you can start estimating, the player can estimate the network throughput, and it can optimize that bit rate. So whether it goes from a lower bit, it goes to a lower bit rate because the network isn't so great, or it goes to a higher bit rate because we've got a great network connection, you'll see exactly what the best video possible for your device and your network conditions. And so what does a manifest look like? And for those in the room, there's a fly on the screen. That's really awesome. Or on the, the projector up there. Um, so what we have here is we have a bunch of different things here. We've got the video tracks, we have the video tracks for iframes, and then the fly is sitting on top of all of the audio tracks. That's kind of freaky. All right. So what do the video tracks look like? We can zoom it in, and for each line you get a stream info, so you get audio bandwidth, so the first line is 1.4 megabits per second. You can see the codex, you can see the resolution is 640 by 360, and then the next line is the URL where you can start downloading all of those segments. And so again, you know, the player, what happens if it starts picking, if you start with a high bitrate stream, it starts downloading the segments, but if the buffer takes a long time to fill, the video doesn't play. So if you start off with too high a bitrate, the video is not going to play. The player knows, oh no, we're going to start losing customers. It switches to a lower bitrate. The buffer starts filling up and the video starts playing. I think this is one reason why 11% of people go away. If you start with too high a bit rate, your customers are waiting and waiting, and then they give up. You know, the study found that the average start time in Europe was 4.3 seconds for a streaming video. This average is a crazy number because you have to think about this is desktop, this is mobile, this is, you know, smartphones, it's desktop, it's fiber, you know, there's so much stuff being thrown into the average to give you one number. 
But you know, you could see that if it takes a long time for the video to start up, we're going to have trouble. So in general, what people do is they organize the different bit rates. And if you start from the lowest bit rate to the highest bit rate, what happens is the video starts off really pixelated. We've all seen this, right? You press play on a video and it's really pixelated and kind of annoying looking, but about three seconds in, it pops up into a really sharp video. This is that video provider getting the video to you quickly at the beginning so you don't abandon. And then it gets, it gets really beautiful by five seconds in. And in general, you're not missing much in the first five seconds of a video. Conversely, if you start with the, one of the higher bit rates, the player may not be able to play that right away. So it switches to the lowest bit rate. And then you end up right where we left off before, but we added a step here. And adding that step is going to cause people to abandon your video. There's one more option, and this is the am option that Amazon uses. And it's the Goldilocks approach, right? Not too big, not too small, but just right, right in the middle. This works for Amazon because most, all of their videos are longer play. And we know that people will hang out for a longer bit of time for a longer play video. So if it may take one or two seconds longer for the video to start up, but it's sharp from time equals zero. And so that's sort of their value add, right? They know that that video is gonna look really great from time zero and it might just stick there, but it's gonna look great no matter what. So in web page test, we can look at all of these with a timeline graph. And so if you start with the lowest bit rate, you can see the video here starts playing at about 11 seconds. When I start at the highest bit rate, at about 11 seconds, it's trying to download that highest bit rate, it fails. And then out at 17 seconds, that quality is exactly the same as the first row. It just took six seconds longer for it to load. And then you can look at the middle row, the Goldilocks approach. At 14 seconds, that video is playing, and it's a higher quality. So you may wait a little bit longer, but it looks great. So there are a lot of different ways we can do this. I'd recommend the first one or the second one. We can walk through the, the pros and cons. When you start at a really, really high bit rate, it's going to look great for everybody on really fast connections with really, really fast devices. But for everybody else, the initial quality is going to be low, and it's going to be a very slow startup. When you start off at the lowest bit rate, it starts off really quickly, but that bit rate may be a little sketchy for the first few seconds. And then in the middle, right, this is where your mileage may vary. The initial quality is going to be good, but it's going to take a little bit longer. So, you know, experiment with it. See what works best for the video that you're serving on your web page or in your mobile app. Another thing that I, so this is, again, another a video that I was looking at. And these are the different uh, bit rates that are available. And the first one you can see is about 1.5 megabits per second. This is actually from a TED talk. And when I was testing on 3G, I found that it started at that high bit rate, but then dropped to the lowest bit rate and sat there for the entire video. Now, in general, the visuals aren't what's important there. It's the audio that you're listening to, and that works just fine. But I was a little concerned, like, why did this sit here at this low bit rate? What can we do to improve the bit rate? And when I looked, you can see that initial bit rate is 1.4 megabits per second but the video is 600 kilobits per second. So what they're doing is they're overstating that first value so that the buffer fills up twice as fast and it doesn't stall out. And that's great, you know, video that stalls frustrates people, but low quality video also frustrates people. So they've gone, you know, you can go, la you can go low quality, you can go uh, low quality, no buffering, maybe buffering, but higher quality. They went like way over here and not in the middle. What can we do to optimize this? Well, the first thing I did is I rewrote the manifest file 600K, 600K, all the way down, right? They're, they all match up now. The first thing you notice is with this graph, the y-axis change, because I just loaded all of the, the I lowered the y-axis. Retesting, I found initially it still drops to that low bit rate, but then by the time, about the time the TED video actually starts, the thousands is that intro. You know, when you start a TED talk, you see all the stars and you hear the TED Talk sound, that's the thousands bit rate right there. And then, you know, eventually it's at that, that better bit rate. Well, this is great, right? We've just improved. It may stall a little bit more because I'm not optimizing for that right now. But I've gotten it so that it, it looks really, really great. But why did it drop to that low bit rate at the very beginning? So I went in deeper into the manifest file. And when it's making these requests, there's three requests here for the thousands 600K. And there's a byte range on each one of those. And then you can see the EXT INF, that's the length of each one of those segments. So the first one is five, the second one is 6.7, the third one is 0.125. Those lengths and the byte ranges don't match up, 
right? They, they're, there's something off with these bite ranges. And so I tried playing with the, the timing and the bite ranges to make them all line up, and I couldn't get it to work quite right. So finally, I said, to heck with it. I'm just going to serve the whole intro thing as one request, 11 seconds long, or 11.95 seconds long. And what happened, really, really interestingly, is now I stay at that high bit rate the whole time through the entire preview. And then by the time the, the video actually starts, I'm at 950 kilobits per second. So I've actually improved the quality of the video. So I've probably taken it from this extreme over to this extreme. It may stall more often, but I've also improved the quality of the video. So there's probably a sweet spot somewhere in the middle where we can, you know, you know, find that sweet spot where the quality is really good and the number of stalls is greatly reduced as well. So in conclusion, we can make video, we can make images look great by, you know, we can make the images look great by reducing the quality, by optimizing the format, by resizing for the screen that we're looking at, and lazy loading those images. And for video, we should only download video when it's being played. We should strip out the audio if the video is silent. We should resize them properly for mobile devices. Check out the third parties, you know, whether it's YouTube or Vimeo or any other that you're adding. And then when you're dealing with streaming, if you start with the lowest bit rate, it'll start faster, but it'll be lower quality. And then you know, be careful with being super conservative on the bit rates to prevent stalling because you may affect quality and vice versa. So a bunch of the tools that I use, I use web page test, the HTTP archive. Here are a bunch of the tools I use to optimize images. And in conclusion, your images and video can be beautiful and fast at the same time. So thank you very much. I appreciate it.